Good morning, Council. This is the case of State versus Lauder. Uh, we will begin uh, with introductions from the court, and I should note that Justice Frydenberg is recused from this matter. I am Mike Havigan, the Chief Justice. Good morning to you all. And now by order of, uh, of my seniority as to time served on the court, the other members of the court will introduce themselves. Good morning. I'm Lindsay Miller Lerman. William Castle, good morning. Stephanie Stacy, good morning. Jeff Funk, good morning. And Jonathan Papik. Thank you, members of the court. And as noted, Justice Frydenberg is recused from this matter. Uh, counsel, Ms. Woodman, are you here with us today? I am, Your Honor. Good morning to you. And Mr. Smith, are you with us today? Yes, I am. Good morning to you. Do morning. either counsel have any questions before we begin today? I have just one question. I don't recall whether uh, one can reserve rebuttal time. You may reserve rebuttal time. Each side has 10 minutes. Right. So do you, re do you wish to reserve? I do. I wish to reserve. Uh, I think I'll reserve one minute. Very good. Um, and the timer will take that into account. With that, Ms. Woodman, you may proceed. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Rebecca Woodman, appearing pro hoc vice on behalf of John Lauder. Um, I would like to submit the issues pertaining to the referendum on the brief. Uh, we fully we briefed those in the in the uh, brief submitted to the court, so we'll submit those on the brief. The issue I, I want to talk about here is. Um, that an evidentiary hearing is required in this case because Mr. Lauder presented facts in his post-conviction petition that, if proved true, demonstrate that he is intellectually disabled and thus within the class of persons for whom execution is categorically prohibited under the 8th and 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and Nebraska law, and that he is actually innocent of the death penalty. Mr. Lauder's claim arose in March 2018 following comprehensive investigation and an expert's extensive review of records, interviews of witnesses, and evaluation and testing performed in accordance with current medical standards that showed sub-average intellectual functioning with an IQ score of 67 and that Mr. Lauder exhibits concurrent and significant deficits in all three domains of adaptive behavior, social, practical, and conceptual, that have been present since childhood. The expert concluded to a degree of scientific certainty that Mr. Lauder qualifies for a diagnosis of intellectual disability. Mr. Lauder then filed his amended post-conviction motion raising his intellectual disability claim and requesting an evidentiary hearing within a few weeks of the expert's diagnosis. These extensive facts supporting Mr. Lauder's intellectual disability claim are unrefuted. Instead, the state argued and the district court held that Mr. Lauder's claim is statutory and not constitutional and was time barred and procedurally barred by the Nebraska Post-Conviction Act. The first claim is simply erroneous. As this court itself has made clear long ago in its decision in State versus Bella in 20, 20, 2006, the right at issue here is both statutory and constitutional. This court has also emphasized that the right protected by the Nebraska statute 28-105.01, the statute that bars the death penalty for juveniles and persons with intellectual disability, and by the Eighth Amendment, is the right not to be executed, where the culpability of the defendant is insufficient to justify the death penalty. The court has stated emphatically that under the Eighth Amendment and Nebraska law, a person with intellectual disability cannot be executed. Moreover, the express language of 28105.01 subsection 2 uh, states that the death penalty shall not 
be imposed on a person with intellectual disability, notwithstanding any other provision of law. Counsel, yeah. I'm a little puzzled by your use of terminology, and it may be that you just misspoke, but you referred to uh, Mr. Lauder as being actually innocent of the death penalty. Don't we normally talk about guilt or innocence in connection with the crime that's committed, not the penalty that may be imposed? Well, Your Honor, we address this issue in our brief, and actual innocence encompasses, at least under federal habeas corpus law, encompasses actual innocence of the death penalty. And under federal habeas corpus law, um, a successive petition is allowed on the basis of actual innocence, whether it's actual innocence of the crime or actual innocence of the death penalty. And I think you can take that doctrine and uh, apply it to Nebraska, where the court does allow successive petitions based on actual innocence. Um, and that's what we're arguing in our brief. Counsel, was this issue of intellectual disability raised in the initial uh, proceedings after conviction and on the direct appeal from the uh, imposition of the death penalty? It was not. There it was no not. determinations about his, his mental uh, efficiencies or his IQ or anything of that nature? There, there was IQ testing done around the time of his trial. And there's been IQ testing that's been done throughout Mr. Lauder's life. And it's really not uncommon in these kinds of cases to see a range of IQ scores throughout the individual's life. Um, and that's just something that has to be weighed um, you know, at an evidentiary hearing. I mean, Mr. Lauder's IQ score, according to uh, the testing performed most recently, is a 67. He has historical IQ scores um, that, you know, are, are within a, a range of scores. Um, at age 10, he had an IQ score of 76, and when it's adjusted for the Flynn effect, which means that the norms were outdated on that test when it was performed, the adjustment the brings it back down to 73. The state, that the, the state alleges that at the time of the original uh, sentencing, his IQ was 92. That's right, but I don't, I, and, and I don't dispute that. But again, so we don't does, know how so, that- So does this claim occur whenever the IQ changes? Can, can it be continually challenged each and every time there's an IQ test with a, with a different rating? Well, I think it depends on the facts of the case, Your Honor, but I think that, um, you know, an intellectual disability uh, claim is, is uh, raised when, um, you know, the, the evidence exists to support a claim of intellectual disability. And so, so it, would never, it, would be, it would never be procedurally barred then, is that correct? It is not procedurally barred. It is not procedurally barred under the plain language of the intellectual disability statute. It says notwithstanding any other provision of law. And the reason for that is because a person with intellectual disability cannot be executed, as this court has plainly said. I beg your pardon. Is, the, is your argument to the effect that in 2018 the facts changed so as to be a new day one, or the landscape of jurisprudence changed in 2018, or a combination of those? Well, I think it's a combination of those things. First of all, Mr. Lauder was never evaluated for adaptive deficits, which is an important prong of the intellectual disability test. The other thing is that the landscape has changed because in Moore versus Texas, the, Moore did, the, Moore, uh, the Supreme Court did two things. One is that um, it clearly established that the Constitution prohibits an interpretation of uh, the sub-average intellectual functioning prong of intellectual disability to apply a cut, an IQ cutoff. In addition to that, the IQ cutoff is only one part of the intellectual disability test. And this court has never decided with respect to sub-average intellectual functioning whether um, the statute establishes an IQ cutoff. 
And the Supreme Court um, has cited the Nebraska statute as among the state statutes that could be interpreted to um, uh, mandate a strict IQ cutoff. And this court has never decided that issue. It certainly declined to do so in State versus Bella in 2010. Um, you, the other are thing you is, suggesting, I beg your pardon. Are, you, we're, are we talking about 28105.01? Yes. Um, are you suggesting that the court establish a cutoff, or the statute requires a cutoff, or to the contrary, there is no cutoff? Which, hearkening back to Justice Funk's question, therefore, if there is no absolute cutoff, an evolving, perhaps more sophisticated assessment could give you a new day one periodically well to answer your question about the IQ cutoff I I don't think it's been decided one way or the other whether the statute establishes a strict IQ cutoff score I mean the state and state versus Bella in 2010 asked the court to apply such an interpretation to the statute and the court declined to do so. So it simply hasn't been decided whether it establishes a strict cutoff. Um, but with respect to the adaptive functioning prong of the intellectual disability test, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that portion of the statute itself, but uh, this court has interpreted that provision in a way that's inconsistent with what Moore requires. And that is that in State versus Bella in 2010, the court said that intellectual disability hadn't been proven relying on adaptive strengths rather than adaptive deficits. And what Moore makes crystal clear is that the intellectual disability determination, that prong of the intellectual disability um, determination must focus on adaptive deficits and not adaptive strengths. So it argument would be to the effect that Moore was in 2017, is that correct? Yes. That you believe it to have uh, implicated a constitutional issue, which would give you a new day one, something to that effect. Well, I think that in combination with um, the statute itself, the plain language of, of which says a person can't be executed if they have intellectual disability, notwithstanding any other provision of law, and that Moore made clear that a court has to apply current medical standards in evaluating a claim of disability, intellectual disability, then I think that does establish a new day one with respect to the facts in this case. Council, when 28105.01 uh, was enacted initially, it included a provision that allowed defendants who'd been sentenced prior to the enactment of the statute to bring uh, a post-conviction claim uh, challenging intellectual disability within 120 days after the effective date of the act. What, if anything, do we make of the language included then and the fact that that language is no longer in the statute? I don't think it makes any difference with respect to uh, the language that exists now. And you know you have to remember that what Moore has done when when Atkins was decided, what the Supreme Court said in Atkins was we're going to leave it to the states to establish a mechanism for determining whether a person is intellectually disabled, and the court later on in in Hall and then most recently in Moore, you know backed away from that because. States were interpreting intellectual disability determinations in different ways, whether it was a, a strict IQ cutoff score and then um, the adaptive deficits issue, which is most important for purposes of more, um, that um, they were interpreting that in a way that was inconsistent with current medical standards. And so uh, when you get up to more, more clearly established the standards that apply to an intellectual disability determination. And the, the, the interpretations under Nebraska law are inconsistent with that. And that inconsistency um, is um, why that lack of clarity on the standards that apply um, is um, 
why Mr. Lauder couldn't file his claim before 2018 when a full battery of testing under current medical standards was performed. If you were to prevail, what's the relief that you would obtain? Is Mr. Lauder resentenced? Is there just an order that the death penalty cannot be imposed? What relief are you seeking? No, Your Honor, we're not asking you to decide Mr. Lauder's intellectually, the merits of Mr. Lauder's intellectual disability claim in this proceeding. What we're asking for is for you to remand the case back for an evidentiary hearing. I understand that. I'm saying if you ultimately get an evidentiary hearing and prevail, what's the relief? Is it that he would be resentenced, that there be an order that he cannot, the death penalty cannot be imposed or something else? Well, because, you know, the death penalty violates his constitutional rights, if an intellectual, his intellectual disability is proven, then his death sentence must be vacated. That's the remedy. Would it, if you were successful in that regard, then would that preclude a reevaluation in the future for double jeopardy purposes, or is that a relevant question? I think that would be dispositive, Your Honor. I mean, the point of the evidentiary hearing would be to bring all of the facts before the district court. And if the state is going to dispute the diagnosis of intellectual disability, which it hasn't done with any facts, then the state would bring facts bearing on that issue and the district court would decide based on the evidence that's presented. So if there were a hearing and you were to prevail and there was a resentence, would that stand for the proposition that Mr. Lauder had been acquitted of a death sentence? Yes, I think ultimately. I think that, you know, the state could appeal from a determination of intellectual disability, but the remedy for a finding of intellectual disability is to vacate the death sentence. Counsel, you allude that facts change, testing and examination processes become more refined. If that were to be the case, and a retesting of Mr. Lauder showed that his IQ was above 70, the state doesn't have the right to go back and seek the death penalty done at that point? I think once his intellectual disability is determined, I think that's dispositive. Now, if at some point in time there were another IQ test that indicated an IQ score of 70 or even above 70, I don't think that excludes the diagnosis of intellectual disability because IQ is not dispositive. You know, the sub-average intellectual functioning exists concurrently with adaptive deficits, and Mr. Lauder shows severe adaptive deficits. And I think what the Supreme Court has made very clear is that IQ is a range, not a number. So you can't rely on a particular number in intellectual testing to decide whether a person is intellectually disabled or not. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Woodman. Mr. Smith, good morning to you. And you must be muted, Mr. Smith. I saw Judge Stacy letting me know. Yes, I was muted. May it please the Court, James Smith, Senior Assistant Attorney General, appearing on behalf of the State of Nebraska. Lauder's intellectual disability claim is both time-barred and procedurally barred. Mr. Smith, if we set aside the argument of procedural bar and time bar, does the State have any argument that the allegations of the fifth post-conviction motion are somehow insufficient to warrant an evidentiary hearing? Well, I guess my response would be if you set aside my entire argument, that's where you would end up. I would note his petition does not, contrary to what counsel said, say that he was 
never evaluated for intellectual disability. Uh, the Aikens uh, intellectual disability standard was established in 2002. There's no allegation in the subsequent 16 years before filing the post-conviction motion that he was never evaluated, that he was never uh, determined to be intellectually disabled during all of those intervening years. Uh, I think that's significant in the context of when he finally made this claim. Um, and uh, so I think that is something that is important. Um, I think it's important for the court to note that the assignment of error claim constitutional, not statutory error per the 18th and 14th amendments. The summary of argument in the appellant's brief is also based on constitutional, not statutory claims. Um, so obviously my brief responded to constitutional claims, not statutory claims, since that was what was alleged and argued. It is, uh, the claim is time barred under the post convictions one year time period. Um, the data on which the factual predicate of the constitutional claims alleged could have been discovered through the exercise of due diligence. We've had uh, 16 years since Aikens. Obviously, that uh, would refute the due diligence. It's, uh, no claim has been made in that intervening 16 years. No allegation was ever made that he was never evaluated. No allegation was ever made that if he was evaluated in the past, it made different conclusions. Uh, all we get is an allegation that, gee, we went and had him evaluated in 2018, 16 years later. That's not due diligence. Uh, as far as the sub D of the uh, post-conviction statute of limitations, the data on when a constitutional claim was initially recognized, if made applicable retroactively to cases on post-conviction review, that would be the Aikens case Neither Hall nor Moore have been uh, held to establish new rules that are retroactive. I would cite the case of State v. Jackson. It's an Ohio case, 159 Northeast 3rd, 1153. The reason I cite that case is it gives a long stream citation of all of the courts in which that court notes uh, there is a substantial and growing body of law that has declined to apply Hall and Moore retroactively, and the Jackson case then gives you a string cite of all of those cases. This, of course, is Lauder's fifth post-conviction proceeding. His second and third post-conviction proceedings after Aikens made actual innocence claims, didn't claim intellectual disability, but he did claim actual innocence. Um, the, this court's opinion in 2009 on Lauder's post-conviction proceeding says it was his second proceeding, it was actually his third. Uh, this court had summarily denied his second uh, uh, appeal from denial of post-conviction. I would refer the court to Judge Cuff's habeas order in 2011. It does give a very excellent summary of the history of Lauder's um, direct appeal his, uh, in his uh, post-conviction proceedings. Um, and so the fact that this court in 2009 rejected what it said was the second post-conviction proceeding is actually his third. The opinion in 2009 does point out that uh, he made an uh, actual innocence claim in that case, which was again denied. Could you, could you respond to opposing counsel's argument that procedural bar, time bar, none of these doctrines are applicable because of the language that says, notwithstanding any other provision of law, the death penalty shall not be imposed? Uh, well, first of all, that's a statutory claim, Your Honor. What he's what she is citing is 28105. That's a statutory claim. It's not constitutional. Her assignment of error was constitutional claims, not statutory. So I think constitutionally, you have to go to uh, Atkins, which then uh, talks about what the constitutional standard is. It called mental retardation, now intellectual disability. But it also describes in Atkins, uh, 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 
a retardation that became manifest before age 18 for constitutional purposes. Uh, I would cite Bourgeois v. Watson, it's 977 F3, 620, a uh, Seventh Circuit case for 2020, which describes intellectual disability as a permanent condition that must manifest itself before age 18. There is no allegation that his intellectual disability is the result of a traumatic injury. Rather, they're going back to and seeing the report they attach, long-standing uh, circumstances before age 18. So that report really is doing the Atkins uh, formulary for um, intellectual disability. I, I wouldn't understand Ms. Woodman's argument to be a statutory claim. I understood her argument to be 28-105.01, particularly the language that says notwithstanding any other provision of law, that that removes the application of doctrines of procedural bar and time bar. How would you respond to that? My response to that would be that the statute does not ex excuse the procedural bar provisions of state law that you do have to make your assertions at the earliest opportunity. Otherwise, you just keep coming back, keep coming back, and keep coming back. There is a reason for the procedural bar. I but what about, it, it does say, notwithstanding any other provision of law. Well, don't, doesn't that usually mean that what follows is going to trump other legal doctrines? I don't think it would, notwithstanding, I don't think it trumps just the procedural bar that you've got to raise it in a timely manner rather than just saying you get to keep coming back, you get to keep coming back, you get to keep coming back. The court's uh, procedural bar rule, I think, is a legitimate rule the court can apply. I would also cite the U.S. Supreme Court decision in McQuiggan v. Perkins. I think it's cited in the briefs, but it's 569 U.S. 383, that that court did say the timing of a petition should seriously undermine the credibility of an actual innocence claim. Um, and in that case, uh, the fact that uh, uh, the claim was not timely made, uh, and they cite the Schlupp standards demanding for actual innocence, uh, it's a very demanding standard in which the timing of actually making such a claim can uh, be a bar uh, to the claim. So even the U.S. Supreme Court recognizes in the actual innocence context that there uh, can be a time bar, procedural bar, that's applied to such, such a claim. I, I, beg your, I beg your pardon. I think the inference is being made that um, there's an evolution of sophistication of testing. And as a result of that, there's more information that comports with more to the effect of um, ad adaptive deficits, which is, um, uh, has become more in, into focus. So with that in mind, and possibly the evolution of testing, if there were a hearing, and if the court were to determine um, that uh, Mr. Lauder is not eligible for the death penalty, would, would that end the matter with respect to sentencing? In other words, would he stand, quote unquote, acquitted of that penalty? And thereafter, there's double jeopardy with respect to uh, imposition of the death penalty. Uh, I'd confess I haven't analyzed it in the context of double jeopardy. Uh, their brief doesn't make that type of an argument. I think, to me, I, um, I'd really be guessing and speculating as to where that ends up, and I, I don't think it, now's probably not the time for me to do that. Mr. Smith, I understand your argument this morning to be suggesting that the phrase, notwithstanding any other provision of law, should not be construed to apply to the time and procedural bars elsewhere in statute in our jurisprudence. Help me understand the rule of statutory construction that you are urging us to apply to get to that result. Um, I, I guess where I would get to that result is I, when the uh, 
rule of procedural bar has been applied, I don't think it's just, you would have to then say we're going to apply it so that there will be never ending opportunities to keep coming back uh, to raise the same issue. And that to me really re leads to somewhat of an odd result that this court would say we're going to allow repeated ongoing uh, post-conviction motions raising the same issue over and over and over again and it would never end, which would to me fly in the face of the uh, basic concept of law of finality. Is this an absurd results argument? Uh, to me it would be. It, to me it would be an argument that that statute is construed so that there will never be an end to litigation. Is that a matter for the legislature or the court? I think it's a matter for the court on its construction, um, especially when we're looking at a fifth post-conviction motion that you would write an opinion that we will now construe this, that we can have post-conviction proceedings ad infinitum. And so uh, uh, anyone who ever wants to make an intellectual disability claim, we're always going to have hearings, and we're going to have repeated hearings and repeated hearings. Uh, that's where this ends. And it doesn't end then. You've essentially repealed the death penalty. <clears throat> there are no other questions, uh, Mr. Smith. Thank you very much. And do we have any time for rebuttal? No, Your Honor. <clears throat> there is no time for rebuttal. That concludes arguments in State versus Lauder.